Good evening and welcome to the Humanities in Class webinar with the National Humanities Center. Tonight's session is titled Combating Misinformation with a Dose of Humanities Inspired Data Reasoning. And I'm very pleased that Jevin West from the University of Washington can join us and lead us in this discussion. Uh, my name is Andy Mink and I am the Vice President of Education at the National Humanities Center, which is located in Durham, North Carolina, and in fact located right at the target of Hurricane Florence. So I'd like to start tonight's session just with a, um, uh, just by saying that if you hear thunder in the background, if you hear the storm that uh, feels like it's building up outside my window, um, then it is in fact a hurricane. And if for some reason I lose power, and if for some reason I lose my internet, and suddenly the webinar ceases to, to work, um, uh, rest assured we will reschedule it or we'll find another way. I, I probably wouldn't stay around too long to see if I'll pop back on. My guess is if the power does go out tonight, then that's probably going to be it for the session. Uh, Jason Chahonis, who is in a, the Teachers Advisory Council just last year, uh, is in Miami-Dade and he sent me a note today kind of wishing me well because last year at this time South Florida was dealing with these uh, severe storms. Uh, tonight it's going to be us in North Carolina. So if you are here in North Carolina, I also I uh, hope that you're safe and you're in a good place. I know most of the folks down on the coast have uh, have migrated uh, westward and northward and somewhere else. But um, once again, if for some reason the technology doesn't work tonight or we get interrupted, it's because of the, the impending storm. Tonight's webinar is a audio uh, only webinar, uh, but it does depend on your participation. And so if you go to the go to training control panel and you scroll all the way down to the chat box, you'll see where you can communicate with me and with Jevin and with others. I very much encourage you to ask questions, to register thoughts, to share your ideas, to uh, add links or URLs or resources that you might use. Um, I think one of the, the real advantages of uh, this right. kind of session is that we have folks literally from all over the country. As you can see from the chat box, there are folks from, uh, from all corners of, of the US and it's really powerful, I think, to be able to share in conversation the kinds of uh, approaches that you use in this topic in your own classroom. Uh, my job as the moderator then will be to mine your comments and your questions and try to, hey Savannah, I'm glad that you're uh, that you're doing well. We were just talking about that. Um, uh, my job is to moderate that and bring those questions into Jevin and make sure that uh, that he has a chance to answer them. If for some reason in this provocative topic you uh, you for some reason I don't get to your question and it scrolls out of view, feel free to uh, say it again or to uh, repeat yourself or to make sure that I see it. The National Humanities Center is very pleased uh, to host this webinar series because I think it really hits all three of the primary functions that we have at the center. Um, seen in the picture in front of you, uh, the center in some ways is a place of scholarly and intellectual pursuit. Our primary mission is to support an annual cohort of about 35 university professors who apply to be a fellow and if chosen come to the center every day for a year and do their good work. They write their books, they do their research, they edit their volumes, they have conversations. And what our education programs then try to do is create bridges between that scholarly world, uh, this world of knowing with a way, a way of knowing. And we try to create opportunities for educators at all levels to work with those scholars and, and be informed and impacted by the scholarship that, that they do. That sense of public outreach is really important to us in terms of advocating for the humanities and creating a community and network uh, that can articulate the real value of the humanities in the world we live in. Um, in, in my view, uh, it's really powerful that uh, that tonight's session really emphasizes the use of data and statistics and, and more of a science-oriented vocabulary in this humanities context to show the way that those uh, work together. And I, I would like to think that all of the work we do is meant to uh, to integrate and to show uh, connections between the humanities and other fields. We do this in a lot of ways. We do this in, uh, with a repository of free and online materials, uh, American class lessons and resources and essays uh, are an important place to go to get vetted quality uh, scholarly informed resources. And I would encourage you to take a look at the URL on your screen and uh, visit that anytime you've got a topic in your class that you think can be impacted by that. And I think this webinar series really uh, is our intent to create a bridge, a bridge that goes both ways. And that is um, a 90 minute conversation, a discussion between uh, experts in their fields, the experts in the content, the experts in the classroom, and, and have them consider and talk about uh, different ways to, to address these compelling topics 
uh, in, a, in a teaching and learning environment. Um, I am also very pleased to note that we've added a new webinar to our series. Uh, if you signed up sort of all at once in August, this one was not on the list, but I would encourage you to go back to our registration page and take a look at making sense of the Second Amendment. Uh, one of the ways that we try to, to organize our webinar series is by paying attention to those, those topics that are both curricular and extracurricular. That is, things that we're, we're all discussing as educators, as parents, as adults, um, and ideally these webinars are intended to give you a much better sense of the topic and the complexities so you can be better informed. And I'm really pleased that Saul Cornell from Fordham University will join us in that conversation on the Second Amendment. Uh, we have a variety of other content that's also free and available to you as educators. Uh, that includes our podcast series. Uh, we have a, a series of podcasts, usually about 12 to 15 minutes long, that are conversations with experts on, on different topics and fields. Uh, we have digital textbooks that you can download from iTunes and use to uh, either in its whole as a compilation or you can split it apart and use it in different parts uh, of your instruction. And we're really happy to be uh, offering our first series of online courses. Um, as a matter of fact, if you spend some time tonight with Jevin and this topic really intrigues you and interests you and you would be interested in a much deeper uh, uh, chance to explore um, digital literacy in the classroom, I'd encourage you to sign up for our online course. Right now we've got two fall uh, courses that are both full at this point, but we will be announcing a spring uh, schedule very soon and you can begin to, to sign up for these five-week, five-module courses. I do want to emphasize that these courses are not self-paced. Uh, we do have an instructor, Karen Cave, my colleague, a very talented online instructor and, um, and a historian and researcher at the center is the instructor of record and so there is a sort of a live component to this as well. Um, we do limit uh, space in each course to 30 so we can give a lot of feedback and we can make sure there's good conversations around this. So if at the end of tonight's webinar you feel like this is something you'd really like to explore more deeply, please keep your eye on our website for the online course that'll be open. Uh, the spring courses will be open very soon. And finally, if you're in the North Carolina area or some, somewhere somewhat near Durham, uh, I'd also encourage you to pay attention to our face-to-face -face, uh, workshops and institutes. Uh, just a few weeks, in fact, we'll be hosting a one-day symposium on positioning Caribbean history in world history with a particular focus on Barbados uh, as, a, as the epicenter of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, in joining us for this one-day symposium at the end of September, please, uh, please use our website to register. So, uh, in terms of tonight's webinar, um, we will invite you to do a survey at the end, and when you've completed that survey, it will kick you a certificate for your participation, and you can uh, save those certificates or share it with your administration to get the continuing ed credits that you deserve. Um, usually, when folks complete that survey, it might take about an hour or so for the uh, for the certificate to actually arrive in your email box. Um, if for some reason you don't get that, feel free to email me or Libby Taylor and we'll be sure to, to figure it out uh, with you, but also check your spam box because sometimes uh, they get hung up there. So that's a, a quick introduction to the National Humanities Center. I'm, I'm so pleased to have such a, a large group with us tonight. This uh, session is sold out, and, and I think it's probably because this is a topic that we're all struggling with. You know, we, we as educators, as parents, as, as citizens, are constantly trying to understand how to make sense of and can critically consume the information that is that is just inundating us at all times. And I think part of the uh, our goals tonight is to not only give you some very practical and reasoned approaches to understanding how to make sense of that data, but also to suggest that the humanities themselves can provide a really clear blueprint or a really clear set of skills, critical thinking skills, that uh, will allow our students to, to better understand how to make sense of uh, the cacophony that they, they often are uh, uh, find themselves uh, in. So. Uh, I'm very pleased tonight to be joined by Jevin West. Um, Jevin, I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to hand you the mic, uh, the uh, the mouse as well. Jevin, can you hear me out in Seattle? I can hear you perfectly in Seattle. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And I, you know, I, I know we talked about how to set this up, but it, rather than rather than cue you up with a clear first question, I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and start with this opening slide and then uh, take us into this deep conversation. Okay, sounds good. And and first, I want to thank Andy and the National Humanities Center. I mean, it's it's sort of a match made in heaven for me and, and for the project, um, just because you know I work in the STEM fields, but 
it's in almost every one of my classes, I'm I'm invoking the kinds of techniques and and the kinds of things that are taught in our humanities classes to sort of question a, a graph or, or or question a data set that's been thrown in front of students in the same ways that we question um, all sorts of things in our humanities classes. And I'm going to try to show you how you know I think it, it's more relevant than ever. And um, and and also feel free to to, to a ask questions. Uh, you know, it's it's not super easy for me to to see all the questions coming in. And if I somehow don't get to your question, or if I don't um, see it and it sort of flies by my screen, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm I'm happy to even get on the uh, the phone. Carl and I, my my colleague, who's um, uh, the kind of co-conspirator in this, um, it, it, we're one of our big um, sort of uh, passions. Uh, you know, definitely over the next year is to try to engage more with high school teachers from all sorts of disciplines. So, so today I'm going to, I'm going to sort of try to make this um, argument that we need the humanities um, in this world that's um, infiltrated with data, but also now um, a, a whole bunch of misinformation. It's not that misinformation or disinformation is never, uh, you know, it's not that this, it's a new thing today. Um, but, you know, I think, I, I think if I had time, I could make a pretty strong argument that, that we might be seeing at least a higher proportion of it today due to the kinds of digital environments that we live in. Um, and also, I, I, before I get started, I, just one other thing, I, I would like to um, really um, invite anyone who wants to take our content or develop you know, their own version of the content um, to, to join us um, with a group that we're sort of forming with high school students or high school teachers and middle school teachers um, in sharing what's working and what's not in, in trying to do this new kind of course. So um, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, about the course itself. So my colleague, Carl Brickstrom, who's a professor in the biology department, I'm a professor in the information school, we have um, for years worked together and for years actually been collecting um, sort of the uh, sort of examples um, in our professional lives, um, in, in research and also in our, in our personal lives, um, the, the kinds of sort of baloney that, we'll, <laughs> that I'll give examples here today, and, and that baloney sort of started to, to, to pile up so high that we um, decided to um, create a course back in um, a kind of late 2016, but we ended up sort of releasing the course in, on January 11th of, of last year in, two, in 2017. And during that time period where we were deciding whether we were gonna teach this course or not teach this course, we really um, struggled with the, with the title. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, you know the, the title that we did land on um, the, the sort of uh, what you're seeing now is the calling bull version and, and that is actually we have a website that, that strips all the swear words away actually and, and the, the, um, the, the URL that you're seeing on your screen right now actually has the, has the, the last four letter, letter extension. We, we debated this for a long time and the reason why we settled on it at least for the college version of the course um, was um, you know the one that we, we treat it as a real um, academic subject. Uh, you know, many people like Harry Frankfurt, like your readings, if anyone had a chance to look at their readings, um, it's, it's treated in a serious academic manner. And in other, it's not, you know, philosophy is not the only field. I recently went to a meeting, um, a national meeting of social psychologists that um, had a session devoted to the ways in which we signal with this word and, and what it means and how um, pervasive it is in the way that we communicate. And that, there, that it's hard to find um, words or terms that um, sort of mean the same, that have the same sort of requirement. We call it sort of, it's a performative act when you sort of call BS. You know, it's not just spotting BS, but it's in that calling BS, that's this performative act. And, and in doing so, it sort of it, it is, a, is sort of a, a, a request for, um, for action. And so, you know, we, we did settle on that. However, we, we, didn't, we didn't want it to, um, to, to take away from the sort of real mission of the class, which was to teach students of all ages, um, you know, undergraduates at the university, but even more important, high school teach or high school um, students, these just basic lessons that are taught in humanities classes and have been taught by librarians, wh whether it's about media literacy, that's been taught by, you know, that has been taught to some degree by some of the STEM classes, but we felt that so much of the STEM classes was turned mechanical and it was just the mechanics that we were teaching students rather than um, rather than really sort of reasoning with the data so that's where you know the name comes from but I, I'm curious to hear since we have 
teachers from all across the country. And, and this is super exciting to look at this list and see all these people. Actually, I flew across the country this morning from DC to Seattle. So I maybe could have waved at many of you that are on this list um, as I went across the sunny part of the United, middle part of the United States and then the, the stormy side on both sides of the coast, at least where I'm at now in Seattle too. Um, not like the hurricane coming in, but we, um, you know, we, we've been curious, Carl and I, on, on how high school teachers would respond to this. And we've been working with high school teachers and just wanted to figure out, you know, is, you know, are we going too far with the term and are, are, there, are there other ways that we could title the course? So I'm just going to leave that as a sort of a question for you. Should we use the full term calling? I'll say it sort of one time. I'll mostly use BS. But <laughs> should, we, should it be calling bullshit, which is sort of the, the original title of this course? Or should it uh, or should we find other ways to deliver the same kind of content? And, and I am and we've gotten different opinions and uh, across the country. Um, and, you know, we've been surprised in, in both realms. We've been surprised actually how how little criticism that we've had uh, that we've had. And also we've been surprised when we have been criticized and rightly so um, by um, the different kinds of classes that have decided not to use the term and instead used the, another version of the the course that we have. So that's a long-winded answer just to say, I, I, I wanted to sort of throw the elephant out in the room, the sort of having a, a high school class with the term bullshit probably wouldn't go over very well with parents. And so, and we're well aware of that. Um, but surprisingly, we have some schools that are using it. We actually have a high school, or uh, uh, it's an all girls um, Catholic school in New Orleans that uh, used the course and, and required that they use the full term. And, and, and then they use that as a discussion point in the class. So I'll stop there on that, but just, just think through it and maybe we can have a discussion at the end. But now I kind of like to sort of take you through a little bit more of the class, get to some of the content and try to, and, and try to convince you that, um, you know, that humanities is, a, is an important injection to the STEM discussions around data. Okay, I'm going to start moving this. Uh, Andy, I think I can move this here, right? So. You should be able to, that's right. And, and okay. If for, if for some reason you can, I can always back you up. Yep. Yeah. So um, so yeah. Why don't you go ahead and just uh, if for some reason I'm not getting seeing the no, cursor. No, it's it's advancing, Jevin. Oh, it is advancing. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. The, can you just go back to this? There it is. Okay. Go back. There we go. I I, I do want to say that when we released the course um, in uh, 2011, early 2000 or 2000 or January 11th of 2017, last year, um, we released the class. You know, it was at night and uh, we thought, well, we hope at least our friends care enough to at least recognize that we, you know, we put this course out um, and we actually didn't get approval by the university. So we kind of broke all those rules. Um, but we woke up the next morning. We had tens of thousands of people from all over the world engaging with the content. We had more emails in our inbox than, than I've ever had. Um, and and from there, you know, there was this just, you know, we we, we rode the wave. Um, we, you know, engaged with uh, universities across the country. We have almost more than 60 universities that now that have a, 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 a sort of contacted us about um, having this course at their university or some version of the course. But after all of that excitement at the university level, we really felt that this really this kind of content, this, this sort of mix of data reasoning, you know, specifically, which is our expertise, media literacy, critical reasoning. Um, in sort of you know in this in this in this in this digital environment that most students live was probably more important than any of the other like data science -y classes I teach or engineering classes or mathematics and statistics classes that I teach and so um, we wanted to figure out you know could we get our students freshmen um, it would be great if those freshmen coming into our university had these kinds of skills so that's so the Knight Foundation put a competition out and we our focus was on trying to translate this to high school students and we're still sort of in the middle of that grant. Okay, um, so that's sort of the background there. Um, we do have a version of the course that has no swear words. I wrote a computer script that every time we put in new content, it takes out the swear word. So it will, um, if, uh, if you go to callingbold.org, if you see any swear words, let me know because there must be, there might be a, um, there, there's something wrong with the script. Um, but we try to mirror the two sites and we're thinking of other ways of delivering the content as well. So, uh, you know, one thing I wanna ask you about, Jevin, if I'm gonna go back on that screen. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually really struck by the, <clears throat> by the choices that you made with these terms. And I'm really pleased to see the conversation in the chat box. And it seems like without, without a sort of a formal um, petition there, it seems like most folks are saying, wow, that's a super powerful word, words matter. Is probably not appropriate for you know a, a K-12 environment, but it really does have some zing to it. 
And then as I look at the screen that we've got up right now, I notice <laughs> notice that in some ways you can also use bull to create new terms. I see the term bull rich modern environment. I mean, that's kind of a those kinds yeah. of that kind of wordplay. I think will will grab uh, students as well. And then as Susan Buddy uh, Susan Buddy says. You, know, you can also use emojis uh, that, that maybe gets it across. That's, so That's a clever idea. I hadn't thought about using emojis. See, that's how old fashioned I already am. Um, <laughs> that's, I, mean, I think that's a fantastic idea. And actually, I love the idea of maybe throwing this to the students, having yeah. them by the end of the course, after you know, going through some of the material, they could then throw it to them and say, you come up with the term. What's the appropriate term that would sort of encapsulate everything that we've gone through? Um, and, and see what they come up with. And, and maybe they'll likely come up with something far better than we, we have, and we'd be happy to, to post yeah. that on our, on our website for sure. Good, thank, thank you so much for addressing that. I'll turn it back over. No, that's great. And please feel free to interrupt. I'm, like I said, I'm trying to, to watch the comments and, and I'm terrible at this sort of multitasking because there's so many good questions here. I wanna stop, but I'll get through some more content and then just keep the questions coming. And again, please contact me. I'd be happy to talk on the phone or over email. We've been doing some direct school interaction. This is just a sample of, of course, there's only three schools, but we have many different high schools across the country and even in other countries that we're working with. We'll be working directly with a middle school at St. Thomas School here in Seattle. We've given um, uh, sort of all, uh, all school sessions at Lakeside School, it's a high school here in Seattle. The McGee School, uh, that's the school I had mentioned in New Orleans. Um, we're, we have several others that we're working with directly and then others that we're working maybe less, more indirectly sort of sharing content and they're sharing content with us too. We want to try to build a place um, to try to, you know, uh, sort of spark other ideas on how to, how to teach this kind of content. This is just a, an example infographic from a student that, um, that we have students that post to us on our, on our Twitter feed and feel free to follow us if um, you want to. But this is... Um, this was uh, an interesting, I guess what's interesting about this infograph, and we have lots of them, is we asked the students to give us a sense of, you know, what are the information sources that you find the most reliable? And, you know, as you kind of expect, you sort of move in, uh, maybe to the top, you might get some of these, um, you know, peer-reviewed science journals. But interestingly, they had Wikipedia at the very bottom, and, and that's been an interesting one, at least for me, and that as I've gotten older and used it, I, I would have said the same thing as the students when it first came out, but I'm surprised at how reliable, at least in my field, it is, but yet most students that we've talked to, at least at the high school level, don't feel that they can trust Wikipedia. But that's one of many conversations that this kind of infographic really sparked when I actually went and visited um, this school in New Orleans. And, and I'd be happy to come visit other schools too, if that would be useful. We're also working with other uh, organizations here in the state of Washington, the social studies, um, the, the statewide organization here. There's a, there's a, a, a life science group that does um, sort of innovative, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, teaching um, seminars that we've been working a little bit called CUBES um, and that, that Carl's done more work with. Also in the state of Washington, we, we were the first state, but other states are now following that now require um, media literacy um, in their curriculum, and that's sort of evolving on what it looks like and where it can fit in to an already busy schedule. Um, and so, and that's the other thing I know with teachers that you know you already your your schedules are 120 percent. You know you don't have any more time for new content. And that's why we're trying to help to create um, things and temp templates and content that make it easy. We've also been doing some curriculum trans translation with some students here at the University of Washington that do research in this area, kind of you know including some of the Common Core standards, et cetera. There's, we're also creating, you know, these, actually we have a non-swear word version too of this, where we're bringing high school students and middle school students to our university and having a one day event around misinformation and disinformation, and also just some just basic research and education. So we have sort of this arm, um, but it's really the class that's at the center. And so that's what I wanna, now I just wanted to quickly go through that because I, I tend to sometimes not get to that. And so I changed it this time, put that first, because it's, uh, I, I really, I, I do wanna figure out um, how we can engage with you as much as possible. But now I kind of want to get into a little more of the lecture aspect. And I think anyone that signed up for this seminar or has listened to other talks in this topic, we all sort of know that we are drowning in BS. And when I talk to students about this, they know this too. We know that our information environments are insincere, they're unreliable. Yeah. We didn't need this course to tell, to tell people that. But I kind of want to break this down a little bit, um, the kind of BS that at least that we see in our environment. Um, sorry, go if you could click that, Andy, I maybe had a little stall there. So just 
just for fun, I, uh, Carl and I like to break up the BS um, that we see in our professional lives and in our personal lives into sort of old school BS and new school BS. Sort of the old school BS would look something like this. In Seattle, we have these sort of startup talks all the time, and we pulled this um, from one of those kinds of um, scenarios. Our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer-driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. You know, I still don't quite know exactly what that means, um, but it, you know, but I, I think that's sort of something that we'd qualify as sort of old school BS. It's sort of the rhetoric and language that actually students are pretty good at. We we try to do some of these pre-test and post-test uh, with these different forms of um, of argument and 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 these forms of BS that that we talk about in the class, and they're actually quite good at this. What they're less good at, and what you know, I think the general public is less good at are things that look like this, but I think are the same kind of BS, but sort of written with different language and, and with different sort of um, methodologies. But here it's like, well, short of statistical significance after bond for only correction, our results underscore a clinically important effect size, blah, blah, blah. But it's, it sounds intimidating. It sounds sort of science-y. And, that, and it's, it's this kind of language that I think we um, sort of are, uh, that I think we're, we're, we're getting um, hoodwinked uh, in a way that I, I don't think um, requires, you know, it doesn't require a PhD in statistics or computer science or, or anything to, to, to sort of combat this kind of BS. And so that's sort of one of the central contributions of this course. We do include philosophy. We talk about fake news. We talk about, um, we, we talk about psychology and things like confirmation bias and et cetera, et cetera. But really, I think the core contribution of the class is um, uh, us trying to teach students how to call BS on this kind of stuff. Um, so, but I need to give you a, a definition if we're going to work with that. Um, and so, here's a definition. Um, so, you know, BS we think involves language, just like Harry Frankfurt did. Um, but we also think that it involves statistical figures, data graphics, and other forms of presentation that are intended, importantly, for our definition, to impress, overwhelm, or persuade. And, and we, you know, and like Harry Frankfurt, we think that uh, you know, a BSer would do this with blatant disregard for the truth. A liar, according to Harry Frankfurt, and also I think we agree as well, a liar knows the truth and it's just trying to push you away from the truth. Whereas a BS, you know, someone that's BSing doesn't necessarily um, care one way or the other. There's, they have sort of a disregard in some ways for the truth where, uh, you know, and it's just about sort of impressing an individual. Now, this definition is evolving, and we're, we sort of have many sort of exceptions, and students come up with great examples that make us sort of rethink this definition. But this is a great discussion point, too, that you could have with students in a class is like, you know, what, you know, BS is everywhere. It really, it's sort of, sort of pervasive in what, you know, in, the, in our everyday lives. And so we have them do these exercises where they keep track for a week. Um, they do a, a, a sort of a diary of BS, all the places where they hear that, whether it's from friends or uh, from marketers or family or professors or whatever, and they mark this down and they, they start to realize that it really is everywhere and, and why don't we talk about this a little bit more? And so having them, after they do this, come up with their own definition is a fun activity. Hey, uh, Jeb, let me ask you a quick yeah. question. Sure. Um, I don't want to get... Uh, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole. So if it feels like I'm about to, then just pull us out and we can continue. But I'm really intrigued by this definition of BS, particularly as you set it against this notion of lying, um, which, which to some degree seems to speak to motivation or intended outcome. And it yep. seems like you're saying, and I, I'm, I'm asking for some confirmation, is that BS is a, uh, it's not well-intentioned necessarily, but it's an, it's an attempt to sort of, um, talk, talk in circles to seem important, whereas lying is an intentional deceit. It, is that accurate? Or yeah, is that, I think that, that's how at least we think that. that's that, that's pretty darn good. I mean, that's kind of how we think about it. At least how we differentiate lying and BSing. I mean, there's overlap in in you can find examples where um, there's intention in in yeah. some ways, but that's how we differentiate. It. Where lying, there it, it, there is more of this intention to move you from the truth. Um, right. Because you know you know the truth, whereas in BSing, the, the the real intention is just simply to you know and to impress you. And so when you use language, you know we see this in education all the time. I mean, I go to talks all the time, and I do it myself. We're we're all victims of it in some ways in education, where we use jargon and we you know we use um, terms that maybe others in the room aren't familiar with. And so um, and that's a way of sort of to impress, even though we probably don't understand the the term itself until a good student raises his or her hand and says, "Wait a minute." 
what what does that mean and then you struggle with it and then they know you're bsing them um, yeah, so it's, also, it's gonna be sort of, <laughs> we do things like you know we you know we almost sort of teach them how to bs through their essays that are due the right. next night and they start them at 2 a.m in the morning or something so they're yeah. you know we're it's the education system is guilty of this as well as, yeah, some, I mean, as others have noted I, I think you're right and i think that's that's part of what all of our participants will probably uh, try to find the line between as they share this with their students is that distinction between BS and lying, particularly as they look at news sources and, and, and sort of, uh, you, you know, um, outlets that have a look that claim to have a little bit more credibility. You know, the, the problem, of course, is that as, as George Costanza says, it's, it's not a lie if you believe it. So um, <laughs> that, that's, 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 I should put that quote in the, in the slide somewhere. That's a great, thanks for sharing that, Andy. I don't have that one. So that's, yeah. that's, that's a good one. And, you know, and, and we do, I will say this about the class, we have a ton of fun and, you know, it's a very serious topic and we, we do pause in the class when things are very serious. There's, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think democracy is at stake um, uh, in, in our, you know, current epidemic of misinformation and disinformation. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a very serious topic, but we also feel like we, you know, to engage students, we have a lot of fun with examples that not are not all serious or not all sort of the kind of um, story that we tell, you know, in the very first class about how leaders across the world have been fooled by misinformation and sent sent out tweets like the Pakistan defense minister responded to a fake news item and was threatening Israel. Um, and it was all based on fake news uh, or, or we were careful with the word fake news. Of course, it's very loaded, but it was it was a it was a news story that was refuted without you know, there was no, there's no doubt even the, the creator of the news said it was, it was fake and they took it as real and they were threatening with, with weapons of mass destruction. Right, so this right. is, you know, it, there's times when it can be very serious and also when it hap deals with our health and stuff. But, um, but this idea of trying to understand this pervasive behavior and the ways in which we communicate as humans and then trying to come up with definitions and, and thinking about examples from the students perspectives. It's just so much fun for us. Um, so yeah, anyway, great, great, great comments. And I'm looking at so many good things on the site. I want to come back to them. Um, so I do want to make this point though, again, I'm hitting it again with this new school BS that numbers in our new world where big data is everywhere and every newspaper has a chart now and every meeting you go into now has some scatter plot or bar chart or something. Numbers appear to carry authority. They sort of they sort of insinuate sort of precision and replication and um, something that comes maybe from science uh, or even or even directly from nature, as Carl and I sometimes say. And this authority can make BSing much easier with numbers. And so this is why I think 37 percent of seminar talks uh, or at least webinar talks include made up statistics. So watch out for those webinar talks, of, you know, like this. Um, but we know this, you know, from, you know, from the humanities. And from the, the, the kinds of discussions we have with students, we, we all know that words are human constructs. They're, they're sort of subjective. And we, but, but there's this sort of, uh, we have, that I've seen over my time in teaching for years now in the sort of STEM area and sort of growing up you know, through in my training in the, the STEM fields, that numbers seem to come just directly from nature. And I think that's a mistake. And I think that's part of the problem that we're seeing at least um, with the, some forms of misinformation that are spreading around. And let me give you, just to sort of be a little bit more concrete, let me give you some examples. So, um, and also I will say this, in our course, we do our very best to be as nonpartisan as possible. And I know there's, uh, you know, we have students, even in Seattle, which is, you know, it's, it's fairly liberal, although I don't come from a, a liberal, I come from a small town in Idaho, and, and Carl and I really try to do our best to be as nonpartisan as possible. So when we show an example of, um, you know, a fake news example, I guess I'm going to use the term loosely, a little more loosely today. If you have a fake news example from, you know, one side of the aisle, we try to find it. We, well, we have no problem finding it on both sides of the aisle. It's like there's so much. But anyway, let me just start with an example here. This is a real quote from um, The Hill. You think countries are giving us their best people? No, they give us their worst people. So if I was to give a student a statement like that and I ask them, what does that mean? They can give it. They get, kind of have a sense of what that means, but it appears fuzzy. They're not, it's not as concrete and precise as, 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 um, as numbers. Numbers, the same story was reported by Breitbart, um, sort of on the same topic, 
and it was that 2,139 DACA recipients were convicted or, com or accused of crimes against Americans. And this number, this 2,139, carries weight. It's big, it's scary, and by the way, it's a real number. Breitbart was not lying about this number. This is a real number, 2,139. But one of the first questions that we ask the students is, you know, how do you, you know, what's a fair way of reporting numbers? And in this case, they usually, uh, but certainly by, you know, middle of the course, immediately say, well, we need to see that number in context. We can't just see 2,100. What does that mean? So if you go out and actually check the numbers on this um, and, you, and, you, and you sort of put it in the context for the full population of individuals that you're comparing, you actually find in this case um, that 0.3%, so one third of 1% of DACA recipients have been convicted of a crime. Compared to, you know, eight and a half percent approximately of Americans that have been convicted of a felony. Now, if you reported that as a journalist, that would tell a much different story and it wouldn't carry quite that weight. And that's the importance of context. But again, this is something that sort of um, is sort of it's, it's sort of intrinsic to what is taught in, in a humanities course. And again, that's an example of the kinds of things that we want to bring in our course. And the, 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 here's another sort of example in this sort of you know, all this excitement around Bitcoin over the last year. Um, there's this, there was many stories, a big drop that occurred. Um, and there were actually, it was, it was during 2000, uh, December of 2017. And there were, there's multiple ways of actually reporting the numbers. So some people may be BSing sort of, or more, or manipulating numbers, but we also try to convey to students that it's actually quite hard to, um, report numbers and really you can tell all sorts of stories depending on how you you, you sort of report it so if you you look at the price drop from 19,200 to 12,600 well you can look and you'd find stories that would have reported bitcoin losing 34 percent of its value in 13 days but there's also stories that reported it the same numbers and didn't even weren't even trying to be manipulative and reported as being overpriced by 52 percent on december 12th so the point here is that you can report numbers, the same numbers, in different ways, and in those different ways, they tell different stories. And so that's one of the big take-homes that we want to give students, and I think we can do that in many different ways. Um, so the big take-home is, number one, um, you need to always look at numbers in context. Of course, you need to ask questions like, who's telling me this? You know, you know, what, how do they know it, and what do they have to gain from it? Some of these basic kind of questions about the source, but if it's a number, argument um, they need to know context and also that just you know telling stories with numbers can be hard and, and many times it's not nefarious but the issue here is that at least in my experience I've, I've helped start several data science programs here at the Univ university of washington data science is this sort of new mix of sort of programming the social sciences statistics and um and in that time developing courses and teaching hundreds and hundreds of students i've realized um and also as a student myself in graduate school and before that, that at the university, we're not really teaching students to question numbers the same way that we have them question other things um, in their education. And that's where I think we really want to bring in the humanities. We're not, we're not asking the same kinds of questions that we, um, that, that, you know, like, like I said, that we, that, that's been happening in the humanities for a long time. And this, this is a lab that I teach. One of my goals now going forward is, of course, to teach students the mechanics. Um, of how to calculate a, you know, a regression to recode, uh, you know, a random forest algorithm. But many of my students go and work in the tech industry, and it's, it's, <laughs> there's real big problems um, with a lot of these engineers that have never had any social science training, never had any real humanities training, and it, we're seeing some of the problems coming out of Silicon Valley because of that. So that's one of the the roots of this this class um, is sort of calling BS on big data and and on the technology world but also um, sort of a, a, a sort of response to misinformation and disinformation. Here's what my students can do really, really well. They can do it better than I can. If I teach them how to, you know, let's say, take the Jacobian of the transformation, they can, they can replicate it, they can write the program, they can do the mechanics perfectly. But if I have them start asking or, or sort of um, trying to come up with the kinds of questions and the sort of deep discussions that we would have and, and, and maybe, you know, that discussion around the, the, the symbolism of the birds and Macbeth, they really, really struggle with that. And in our class, so our class, you know, you know, luckily and partly, partly it's because of, <laughs> it could partly be timing and the name itself, but our class 
sells out and we have huge waiting lists and our president wants us to teach it you know to you know every student that comes from you comes through the University of Washington but what um, we've um, sort of pushed back a little bit one because if we had a required course it was about calling BS students would call BS on that um, so we still want to make it an elective but also we want to make sure that we get these kinds of conversations in the class and in these classes we have a we have you know 40 different majors across campus that, that are in these classrooms usually and what we find when we do these pre these these tests that we've come up with, many of the humanities students, without any data training, um, perform the best. The philosophers, for example, the students that are in philosophy do really, really well in these tests around data reasoning. And so we're really trying to, you know, we think it's an opportunity to bring all these students from these different majors together, and then you know, hopefully those engineers will sort of feed off what's being taught in the humanities courses. Hey, hey Jevin, let me yes. let me just underscore that a little bit too, and because it sounds like, um, in, and in some ways this webinar is a really nice example of how this might happen, but you know, with so many participants in our webinar right now, some of which come from STEM fields and classrooms and others from humanities, this feels like the perfect intersection, and maybe we're encouraging teachers to reach out to their STEM colleagues or you know, there's science or math teachers on their uh, on their teams or in their schools to really start to do this together. So it's not in silos. This isn't a, a humanities course. It's not a STEM course, but it's it's sort of a holistic one. You got it. So you basically, like, Andy just uh, like summarized it probably better than I can because I'm, I'm webinars are hard for me because I want to I want to see everyone and talk to them and engage in physical. So uh, he he summarized it better. He's more used to this. So yeah, exactly. The, 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 this course is meant to be this attempt at bringing STEM and the humanities together. On our campus, like on many university campuses, the humanities are you know, being decimated with budget cuts and, and, and students all wanting just to do computer science or, or uh, you know, engineering. And I think that's a real m mistake going forward. And again, I can, I can give many lectures on sort of, at least from the technology field, mistakes that you know, may have been avoided if, if some of these engineers would have had more, a little more training in that but also i think humanity students have something to gain sitting with those um engineers too so i you know i think um you know this this course is an attempt at that but there's going to be many many renditions and we're not the first one that to just sort of want to bring these together i think the real you know, if there is a unique aspect to this particular course um it's it's our our focus on the data reasoning and bringing in uh, 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 these other aspects um from the humanities and the stems and into sort of one class it also has lots of current examples we try to do our best to do current fun examples and then do it within this digital environment that students live specifically yeah. we, you know we talk about social media we talk about the um you know why we see echo chambers we talk about um sort of from a historical lens you know what's going on with propaganda etc so um so yeah so that's that is that is the goal and and yeah this is where i would love to engage with the, the, the teachers on here because they'll you'll have made way better ideas than than we have as well just to give you a quick look at the syllabus oh sorry Andy did you want to say I, something I, I do actually I'm, I'm gonna just kind of bore down on that a little bit and I'm gonna reflect a question that Susan has asked and that is in your experience so far um, what exactly is it that makes some of the humanities uh, students and she asked specifically about the philosophy student space I think you brought that up what what is it in your opinion seems to what skills do they bring to the conversation that seems so unique and so uh, effective? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great question. And, 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 you know, I don't fully have a great answer as to why they perform so well. I can just show you the numbers, speaking of numbers, <laughs> you know, numbers maybe lying or telling us something interesting. Um, but what we find is, and we found this in multiple classes, when we do so, some of these quizzes, the philosophers sort of, you know, on average, they don't all do better, but they, they come out on top. And I think part of it is their training and sort of, logic and argument it's yes. it's you know that critical reasoning translates well when we start showing them you know the issues with a graph which i'm going to show in just a sec some you know specific ways in which we engage with the students with the data and these kinds of questions that a philosopher student philosophy student or a student from anthropology or or from from history or from comparative literature they they just seem to to just latch on to this idea of, of, of questioning it and digging digging down further than just sort of accepting a, a scatter plot that says that, you know, that says that, you know, there's, there's been no increase, you know, uh, in, in temperature, you know, uh, you know, over the last hundred years or something, you know, by the ways in which the graph itself was manipulated. And I, and I will go through some examples, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, you know, I, I can't give a, you know, a specific 
like lesson they may learn or, or, or a technique they're using. It's just they ask, the, they seem to ask the right questions and they're just asking questions uh, and, and are less accepting of, of what they're seeing. And they know there's context by which data is created and they know there's context by which data is interpreted. That's sort of a key thing. It's not just on the side of the input data, it's also in the interpretation of that data where um, the students that sort of have that training in critical reasoning do really, really well. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And I see so many other questions here too. So it did sort of take off and that was fun, but that's not the part that Carl and I have been excited about. Um, the thing that we're most excited about are all these universities and high schools. I don't list any high schools on this that are that are that have reached out to us and said, "Can we use a con content?" We said, "Of course you can. Uh, yeah, anything we have is for free. The only thing we ask is just tell us you're doing it, so if, you know we can we can sort of reach out to you if we have new content, or also so that we can defend ourselves when our administrators might tell us we can't teach our course or something." And that's a whole nother. Our, our university has been quite supportive, but. Um, you know, there could always be the, uh, another administration that, that wouldn't be supportive of it, uh, of teaching this kind of course. So we have all sorts of tips for spotting BS. And I just sort of, here are some of the things that we sort of talk to students about. And there's many, many more. We have over 50 hours of lectures. You can go to YouTube. We make these freely available. We'll keep adding content. We're actually going to, we have a book that we're finishing that's going to be a trade book written for the public and hopefully accessible to high school classes as well. We're going to we're, you know, we have different ideas of how, you know, how we'd follow up with that. Um, we also have, um, we have students that are now, uh, you know, building their own content from what we have. So we, it, so there's this little community forming, maybe a little BS movement that's happening around the country, which is exciting. Um, but, but, you know, ultimately comes down to some tips that we want to teach them in spotting, but also in calling BS. And that's, that's the hard thing for a lot of students. Many of them are good at spotting it, but this is not a class about just spotting BS. So we teach them refutation techniques. We teach them ways to um, engage with, uh, you know, with um, sort of prevailing ideas that are hard to debunk with your, you know, your, you know, your, you know, uncle at, uh, at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and, and also we talk a lot about civics. And one thing I was going to say here is I think we're really missing that at the university. This, in, you know, teaching students how to, to engage, to, to, to have sort of um, productive dialogue and to do that within a civic manner. I, I think living in a digital world sort of makes that, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's more difficult for them, maybe that's just me being an, uh, an old, you know, old already again, um, but we, we do spend the first several classes talking a lot about civics and we think that's important as well. I'm not gonna go through all of these tips, I just sort of put some of them up to give you sort of a flavor of the kinds of things that we, we look at um, and you know, there's many, many more, and, and we can send you material too if you need to use it for your class. We, you know, we start, of course, with the basic questions again. You know, who's telling this? How do they know it? What's in it for them? Um, but we really uh, want students to engage with specific examples, and we have unlimited examples. As you can imagine, if you're teaching a course on BS, you have unlimited material every day. I mean, I find stuff, Carl and I find stuff, and we throw it in Evernote and in our folders. We have so much, you, you, you know, you always have, there's so much um, um, uh, examples out there. But here's, this, this one I think is good in displaying how data can tell any story that you want. So this was actually a, an article published by the Wall Street Journal making a case for who we should be taxing. Should we be taxing the, the lower class, middle class, or upper class? And so they created what's called a histogram. And histograms sort of add up in each one of those different categories on the x-axis the um, the number of individuals, and then in that case, the, the you know the amount of funding that could come through taxation. And so, if you look at that, it, it seems reasonable. And there's lots of histograms, although it's one of my big pet peeves uh, in in reviewing papers is when uh, these things are manipulated. And you can see this if you zoom in a little bit. You notice something about this particular histogram. These categories start off in in chunks of 5k. And then they sort of jump to, you know, 10K, um, you know, 25K, et cetera, et cetera. And then they get really big. They get five to 10 million. And the issue here is that if, you, if you're allowing me to change the bins of any size, I can tell any story I want. And this is what, exactly what was done by Ken Schultz uh, via, via Brendan. They basically said, okay, I'll take the exact same data and I'm just going to manipulate the size of the bin, which is on the bottom. How, you know, what are the, what are the boundaries of each one of those buckets? And you could then rewrite that Wall Street Journal story. And by the way, Wall Street Journal is a fantastic journal. I, that's why we, we take them from everything again. I just want to keep reiterating. We, we get these examples from across the board. Um, 
but you could write a story that says that says we should be taxing the poor if you change those boxes in in a way that 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 shows that kind of graphic you can say you can make a case about taxing the middle class and you can also do it um, by uh, you know making a story about taxing the wealthy and the point is when we do these kinds of examples the students you know start laughing at first and start realizing wow um, this is it's not that hard to manipulate any story you want with data and we actually do an exercise this the students is one of the more favorite exercises that the students do during the course because it's really eye-opening we give them all the same data source and then we break the class into three different groups so for example we might give them world health data and have them make an argument that the united states single uh, payer um, health care system or, or a single payer health system or, or our current system is is one of the best or it's one of the worst and we break you know a third of the class is supposed to make an argument that it's the best you know third says that, that it's not and then the hardest group of course is the group that has to be neutral they're the sort of journalists of the group and they have to take the same data and then tell their own story and what we fought the students afterwards that's one of the things we receive so, so many comments after they they just they come out and say that was it's so easy to manipulate data and once they realize how easy it is for them to do it then they're always questioning every graph we put up um, or anything they start seeing. This is one of the one of these kinds of exercises that I think uh, has been really useful for us. Now, get, of course, you, oh, hey, sorry, Jim, Andy, go ahead. It's okay. Do you get a sense that it's uh, it's a bell that can't be unrung? That once your students sort of see <laughs> that in their lens, shifts, that they that they can't not be cynical in that in that critical way? That is a really it's a really good question, and and there's a serious side to that. So in, in some form, we want our students to be skeptical of what they're reading uh, in almost anything they read. But there is a point in which we don't wanna go too far. And, and that's one fear that we have in maybe taking this content to middle schools is that we don't want students to have no truth or no faith at all in, in the world in which they live. And especially when we even attack areas of science because we're, I'm, I'm, I'm in love, I always have been in love with science since I was a kid. And I start my lectures with that. But then during the middle of the lecture, I'll say, here are some of the issues where there is BS in science too. But then I end the lecture saying, but you still fly in 747s, you still have an iPhone, you still have vaccinations, um, et cetera, et cetera, that despite many of the problems we have in our information environments and in the integrity of that information, that there is still truth and there, and you can still have, you know, you don't have, you know, I don't want to turn these middle schoolers all into a bunch of nihilists. Or, uh, so, so yes. Yeah, so I don't want their bell to be rung so bad that they have no, tr you know, you know, you know, they they don't have any faith in the the, system, the the world in which they live. But we do want it to, to ring their bell a little bit. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so so you know, when we're talking about data, the way that we tell stories with data, of course, was with graphics. But you know, most graphics, you know, before in the you know 19th, 20th century, you know, were quite simple. We had pie graphs and we had these kinds of um, you know geographic graphs and you know 2018 they've become much more sophisticated um, I'm kidding here of course this was a uh, this was a um, a graph believe it or not that was published by MSNBC and when we talk about visualizations and how you um, how you display data this would break all the rules I mean it makes no sense to have you know this flat line what they're trying to do is of course tell a story that really doesn't um, that really doesn't exist to go from zero to two and up so despite all these new tools and doing visualizations, we still get these very simple and also silly uh, ways of um, displaying data. But you know, all the journals and all the uh, you know newspapers and all, they all make mistakes, including the New York Times. And actually, we just used an example recently from the New York Times that made a mistake. But part of it is also using these really new and exciting interactive visualizations. And these are great um, ways of telling stories. But the problem is when you turn over these tools you know, to the user that may not be familiar with the ways in which they can be manipulated and the millions of different views you can have in these interactive visualizations, there, there's problems to be had. And, and some of my colleagues here at University of Washington have written several papers about this and, and, and how, where those problems can occur with these new interactive visualizations. And so one of them is this multiple perspectives issue that if you look at enough views of the data, you can find, you know, basically statistical significance in a form you're not because you're not doing the actual statistics but they use this as an analogy because in statistics if you check if you you know if you query the data enough times you're going to find something eventually that's significant even though it might not actually have biological significance 
confidence. It might come out uh, as with a p-value of whatever, um, and you might be able to publish a study because you had a p-value less than 0.05. But the problem is, if you you know you query the data enough times, and this this kind of concept we try to get around to the students. But again, we go back to the examples and just very simple ways of manipulating just the presentation of that data, the the gra the, the ways uh, the, the the data is graphed. So here is a graph from Statista, and Statista is not it's not it doesn't have any partisan leaning that I know of. It's not it's not left leaning or right leaning that I know of. It's just a place that tries to make money by selling data sets, and they have produced um, this uh, chart where they show that carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel ha have basically leveled off. Um, and if you look at that data, it's, it's fairly convincing. But I'll pause for a second. I, I'm, if you can see it on your screen, I wonder if anyone sees any issues with this one. And let's take a moment and let folks look at that and, and just type into the chat box uh, if you see some yeah, kind of- Yeah, if you see an issue with this particular graph. Um, yeah, yes, Susan, we'll, we'll I see a question. Could you post the website address for the resource? Absolutely. Uh, there's Scott yeah. Smith in uh, Tennessee. Dates are too yep, far. Yep, you got it. So, and then Jason also um, also noted that it goes in 30-year segments, and then all of a sudden to one-year segments. And again, this is very similar to the histogram changing of bins, where you you're you'd be amazed at how many different ways you can present data if you allow if you allow me to manipulate the axes. And the the issue here is that if you switch the axes halfway through you're gonna get strange results. So what I did is I took that exact same data and had evenly spaced tick marks, which is kind of the rule that's been around for a couple thousand years. Um, and when you do that, this is the data you'd see. And the, the reason why it flattens out is because there's a, this is a trick that actually, some, I don't think necessarily that was nefarious, but this happens all the time. And you have to look out for these manipulations of the x-axis and the y-axis, and they because they can do very strange things too. So that's the exact same data, but with even ticks on the x-axis. So let's take that a little bit further. There's also, even in our best journals, peer review, Nature in Science, uh, you know, in the world, in the world of science, if you get a publication in Nature, you know, it's the, you know, it can change your career. So people, you know, the the the, the level um, of peer review and checking is really high. But even in Nature, things can get through that don't make sense. So here was a study. Or it was a yeah, it was a study that was um, published in 2004 in Nature, and the claim here was that women sprinters look like they are closing the gap on men, and according to the study, one day could overtake men. And that may be true. That totally may be true. And the way they did this is they looked at the sprint times, 100 meter sprint times for men and women, and they found that the the women in the red uh, uh, dots were going down faster, and they applied a linear model, and they concluded from that model that that women were going to out sprint men in the year 2156. But does anyone see a problem with this particular graph? And yeah, we'll I'll just pause, pause, it's, pause for a minute and let, let folks take a okay. look at that. Uh, give you a chance to catch your breath, Jevin, get a drink. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing uh, good answers already. Yeah. Yes, very good. You, I see some great answers. So um, there's, there's several things wrong with this. And, so, so I'll give you the quick answer. Um, well, actually, I don't want to give the answer yet because I want some people still thinking about it. But I will say this. The, a, a high school class in Texas um, and another high school, I think, uh, I can't remember where else. It was in, it was in the United States. They had, they had found this issue and they wrote a letter to Nature. And there were other people that wrote letters too because they had noticed some of these problems. But here's what the, uh, one of the, the, this is basically, this is the one time that I'll get to show you one of our strategies on refutation. One of my favorite strategies for refutation is something called reductio ad absurdum, and that's to show an argument's methods or assumptions, how they lead to ridiculous conclusions. And students love doing this. It's really hard to do, and actually reductio is a more advanced method of refutation, um, but, but it's a lot of fun if you can get it right. And these high school students that did do this in real life um, were able to notice the problem. And so here was a letter actually that Kenneth Rice wrote, which was similar to what the high school students had, and he wrote here, A.J. Tatum and colleagues calculate that women may outsprint men by the middle of the 22nd century. They omit to mention, however, that a far more interesting race should occur in about 2636 when times of less than zero seconds will be recorded. So some of you have noticed that. Um, you wrote that in the, the little chat box. And I love the ending of this particular um, reductio. In the intervening 600 years, the authors may wish to address the obvious challenges raised by both timekeeping and the teaching of basic statistics. 
So the problem here is that they built a model and they made conclusions, but of course, there are many reasons why you wouldn't apply a linear regression there, but you don't need any uh, you know, advanced training in statistics to know that if that line is going down and you make an argument just arbitrarily somewhere down that line, that you have to keep going as well, and that leads to silly conclusions. And so, the, you know, again, it's high school students that have this ability to sort of ask the questions and sort of take an argument with data, so a data and, and, um, and, and the skills that they get in some of these classes. Here's another example. This is the only climate um, change chart you, you need to see that according to the National Review, and I think many of you see the problem here. This is real data. They didn't, the data itself is real. Um, it's uh, from NASA, and the claim here is that, you know, that it's a flat line, so what do, so what do we have to worry about? And the, the, the problem, of course, is that they've zoomed out so far that you can make any line, even a diagonal line, seem flat if you do that, and that was refuted um, nicely by Philip Pump, and the Washington Post took that same data and said, well, you know, if you zoom in, and in this case, it's okay to zoom in, because sometimes you don't want to zoom in too far, and that's another uh, sort of lesson we talk about in our class, but you see this approximate two degree increase over the last half century, and then people can then debate whether that's real, but to zoom out too far is, is probably not a fair thing to do, but it's the reductio uh, that was, here's the reductio that I think was my favorite, which was Bloomberg then wrote, um, saying if you buy that National Review uh, tweet, then I can put time on the x-axis and the y-axis, so you put the same variable time on both axes, and if you zoom out far enough, you can prove that time doesn't march forward. So, so this is the kind of sort of reductio that we have some fun with, and again, what it does is it just takes simple data and, and, and the many different ways that data can be presented and try to teach students how to question it and look out for some of the obvious tricks and, and mistakes too. Now, here's another one. And it's, uh, you know, given a lot of the discussions around gun deaths, uh, the state of Florida enacted the Stand Your Ground law in 2005, and um, people wanted to know whether that law, what kind of effect that law was going to have. And so the data came out, and then this article was published um, by Reuters. And what you find in 2005 is you see this line dropping down here um, uh, following the law. But what's wrong with this particular chart? <laughs> what do you guys see I, in this chart? Um, yeah, I think some of you are already starting to see it there. The y-axis has been reversed. Again, breaking conventions that, you know, that have been around since the beginning of the first graph ever, and that'd be fun to figure out what the first graph was. But this was a convention that, you know, if you just quickly saw this in a tweet, which is how a lot of our information or on a Facebook post, then it may change your opinion by the way the data was presented. And so you can still debate the effectiveness of this stand your ground law. You know, you can make arguments for and against, but we certainly don't want graphics that are being misleading. And this happens all the time. And to defend this the person that actually created this graph, um, she, uh, this, this person that created it um, you know, was trying to replicate another graphic that had sort of blood dripping down and trying to add sort of an artistic side to it. So in this one is another example where I don't think the person was being malicious. I just think it was an honest mistake. There are malicious examples, of course. Um, but the point again here is to, to look out for these kinds of things. And, and you know, one of the other big ones um, that we come back to, one of these big these concepts that we come back to all the time with students is that if a claim sounds too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. And so this was a, a, this was a chart that was spread virally uh, across, the so, across social media. Um, it started actually with a real data report, then it then it landed in a, um, a blog, and then it landed in the newspaper. And Washington Post actually posted this. And what they're looking at is the age of death by music genre. And the reason why this thing took off is that people were really worried, um, you know, after reading this, because you know many kids, you know, parents had kids that were maybe going into punk or metal and, they're, and they were saying sort of OMG gonna make my girl quit her metal band because you know look at the people on the right people that, that liked music and or played music and rap or metal or punk were dying at a much faster rate um, than those that played blues or jazz or country. But of course and this by the way this moved through it got published in some of the best national papers what's, pro what's the problem with this one? Give folks a chance to, to look at this one. What do you see wrong in this particular graph? 
It's funny. By the I'm, way, I, lo I love the math magician spell. That was really, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that term that Susan just put out. That's really great. So, um, so there's all sorts of things wrong here. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so people are asking sample sizes and the genres at these different time periods. The problem here, this is a very common mistake that we see with data presentation. And first of all, there's two things that, that I should note right off the bat. If you see something fall off that great and it sounds too bad to be true, it probably is. So that's one big red flag that you could use to teach students. But the other one here is something called right censoring of data. It's, it's a problem that we see all the time that's not taught enough. And the issue here, the reason why it's right censored is that those that played the blues have had a lot longer time to live. So the, the, the genre has been around longer. So those that, that did die, some of them did die, let's say, in the, their 80s. But some of these music genres haven't been around long enough. So those that did die didn't get a chance to be 80 or 90. And so they, there's this skewness to the data that's built in just because of this something called right censoring. And this, and this uh, I mean, in fact, this was so funny. Like I said, there were people writing that it's a cautionary tale to some degree. People who go into rap music or hip hop, they're in a much more occupational hazard compared to war. So it was, I mean, people were talking about this, but there was this issue with the data set. And there may even be subtle differences in genres, but they're certainly not that big of a difference. And the problem is, of course, in our social media world, is that you might start as a scholarly article, it goes to a popular article, from there it might turn into a data viz, from that data viz, it then might go to places like the Washington Post, which are you know, a good, good journalistic venues, um, and then those then land in tweets. And those tweets then spread virally, people you know, uh, uh, sort of digest those and don't dig in deeper like we want our students to do, and then they might think that, that, that you know, going into sort of uh, you know, hard rock is more dangerous than going into World War II or something. And that's just not the case, of course. And, and that could, you know, by teaching students these kinds of tricks um, about looking at things like right censoring or left censoring and all these other um, little things that we try to teach the students, um, hopefully make them more critical of the kind of data arguments that they're seeing in the world. The other big thing, I'm gonna end with this next example. I'm gonna go through it rather quickly, but I'm happy to slow down for another conversation if you want, but I want to have leave time for conversations. But this is kind of an important point about the, 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 the kind of philosophy that drives our class, especially in my area of tech, where we now you know, sort of are all sort of, you know, it seems in, in, in the media, enamored with machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, and also just this, you know, this influx of you know, the, uh, the work coming out of computer science and sort of the STEM fields. And, the, and this idea of don't be intimidated by this black box. And so this philosophy can kind of be thought of like this, that so much of our data world and so much of our technology world is run by these black box algorithms. That could be a neural network algorithm, that could be these fancy you know, statistical methods that are used on top of data, and that can be intimidating to people. But what our goal is, is to teach the public, and we think we can do this with high school students, maybe even middle school students, that if we teach them about the data input, to focus their attention on the data that's coming in and the data that's coming out in the interpretation of that data, many times they can call BS on that data without knowing anything about the black box. So let me give you an example. So um, uh, a little over a year ago, there was a paper published on the archive. And that's something that my colleagues and anyone in the field sort of tracks, because those are sort of new papers that are hot and exciting to come out. And this one caught my eye, of course, because this already sounds wrong. This automated, basically inferring someone's, um, whether they're a criminal by just looking at their face. Now that should be scary, but that didn't stop these engineers from publishing this. And what they found, uh, oh, by the way, this goes back to Cesar Lombroso, who talked about this in you know, the 1870s, where he's sort of the, considered the father of criminality, but he ended his career with this you know, sort of uh, you know, undertone of the pseudoscience sort of idea that if you look at the morphological features of someone's face, you can tell whether they're a criminal. Now, it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, it was refuted, but it's come back strongly within the computer science and, and within technology. And just to give you a quick idea of applying this method of only focusing on the data input, the, um, the researchers, what they did is they took photographs from convicted criminals, um, uh, from criminals and, uh, and those that are just from sort of professional business sites like LinkedIn. They don't have a LinkedIn in China, but this, so I call it linked out. But what they did is they took these, they trained the, um, the computer, uh, vision algorithm with these data sets, and then they reported the results. And this is what they report that 
and I see this in these papers all the time, unlike a human examiner, a computer vision or classifier has no subjective baggage, having no emotions, no biases, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we tell students anytime they hear that about computers and about data and about AI, it's BS. Uh, now, I use the full word here because it really gets me <laughs> going because computers and the data that's used to um, sort of ingest into those computers have as much bias as humans because it's the humans that, that sort of generated that data and it, it's even worse than that. So I won't go into that in detail, but just it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem within this field. And this is where I think humanities can step up and sort of, um, sort of help, help train some of these engineers. The idea here is that um, they, the result was they said, if you look at this angle theta between your nose and the corners of your mouth and this row, um, this sort of curvature of that mouth, that's what is the giveaway between those that are criminals and not criminals. And if I, I'm rushing through this, so I'm not giving you time to think about it, but if I sit there long enough and I, and I dis, uh, let the students sort of discuss among themselves, they finally realize what the issue was. What they find is that, what the, that they had they basically developed a smile detector. So their input data was data with people that weren't smiling. So these criminals were not so happy about their, their situation probably or whatever. The point is that they, they, they had um, data with images in their training set that were essentially mostly frowning. And those that were not criminals were mostly somewhat smiling. And so um, what they had discovered, which would have been great maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago, was a smile detector and not a criminal detector. But this thing spread on the news. And of course, our fear is that governments would start using this kind of, or companies might start using this technology. But you noticed when I did this, I never once, and by the way, they have these criminal subtypes and non-criminal subtypes, I never once talked about um, the black box. All I did was look at the input data and the output data. And by the way, you think that's where it would end, but there was a recent paper this year that took it a step further out of Stanford of all places. Um, they claimed that there was new AI could, that could guess whether you were gay or not by just looking at a photograph. Now that problem with that one, and you can go to our website and we go through in detail why we think it's wrong, that has to do with the interpretation, so the data output. And we try to teach students, again, not to be intimidated by that black box, but to just really focus on the data that's coming in. Is there, are there selection bias issues? How did they interpret that data? What could have gone wrong with the data itself? Don't worry about the algorithm. So that's one of our, one of our central philosophies too around this. So here's where I want to end. I talked about old school BS and new school BS. Now I just want to end with you know, a little bit about the technology itself and how that's sort of uh, involved in sort of the spreading of this misinformation. So there is this old school tech to use sort of the same terminology and new school tech. And so the old school tech, um, it used to be things like this. And this is a picture of a, a football player from our Seattle Seahawks here. Um, it was is Michael Bennett. He was celebrating after an Arizona Cardinals win back in 2016, I believe. And then what happened not too long after that was that this, pay, this, this image was associated with a burning of the flag. And of course, that, that sort of goes right at this, sort of this issue between uh, what's going on in the NFL and um, what's uh, you know going on you know in the political realm, and what happened is this thing spread what like wildfire, you know, no pun intended. Um, and the 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 technology that we use is just old-fashioned photoshopping, and it was found that it was you know of course photoshopped and wasn't true. But that old school tech is still quite effective. But we have new school tech that scares me. It actually comes out of our university and out of the research labs at Adobe. Now, not only can we do photoshopping, you can do photoshopping of voice. And if you, if you look at this video that's a demonstration of it, Jordan Peele, who's a comedian, actually used this technology to make this point about this scary new technology that's coming, that we need to teach our students that it's not just Photoshopping that you can sort of fake a, a story with. You can do this with technology that makes people sound like they actually said something, both in video and audio. And so there's this new tech that's coming that's going to make it even tougher to combat the kinds of issues that we're seeing um, with fake news, et cetera. And these are having real effects. So of course, a lot of people have heard about the vaccination issues, um, and the, the, the problems that are going on, and the misinformation that's being spread, even by foreign adversaries. There was a recent research report that showed that Russia has been involved in, in um, sort of sowing disinformation um, um, and having these disinformation campaigns around vaccinations. But I've, I just I recently gave a talk at a dental conference where they're really struggling with you know, fighting back against this misinformation around fluoride. This was passed around by Alex Jones and Infowars and, and has been a favorite topic of theirs. And it's been, it's really hard to fight back um, 
with this kind of health information. We also have our search engines, our tech that um, that you know when people see something in on a search engine, they they sort of almost believe that it's true because it exists. But you can't the the the, the refutation to a, a silly sort of idea can't ca the, you can't catch up to the actual. Uh, wrong idea. So Carl and I thought about what is the craziest thing we could put to see if there was a website that Google would find for us. If you said, do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? And lo and behold, what you will find um, is websites that say that. And the medical community doesn't have time to sort of refute some of the silliest claims like this, but they exist. And sort of the search engine almost makes something real by gobbling up all of this stuff. So we have the search engine issues. Another issue is the, the recommendation algorithms. <coughs> Excuse me. So YouTube, my son loves um, the International Space Station. And when I went there recently, on that video, you would think would have no sort of, it would be a neutral kind of video. What I found was that next to that video, the recommendations were for videos around, is Earth actually really flat? Um, and, and that's as neutral as it can be. What we're finding, and this has been reported in many newspapers, that this has become a real problem, that these search engines have evolved in a way that are pushing people specifically to misleading material and divisive material. So we need to make students aware of that. So I'm gonna sort of skip these last couple things, but the point is that we're sort of driven by a lot of this click-driven stuff that, you know, unfortunately the unvarnished truth is no longer good enough and students nowadays have to contend with that. And so we do spend a lot of time talking about this kind of thing. We talk about the economic incentives um, that are sort of driving a lot of the fake news and what social media campaigns are doing and how this the fake news or sort of false rumors actually, according to many studies, spread faster. They're designed to spread faster on social media. So we have a lot to contend with. You know, in the olden days, we used to have to deal with counterfeiting of money. Now we have counterfeiting of people. This is something that my colleague Carl has been thinking a lot about. You know, this counterfeiting of people, I think, is what students have to deal with. And all the propaganda that's been around forever will continue to be around but how um, the, the tools that the propagandists have are, are much more um, sophisticated. And the point that they, the, what they have at them is this, they have this modern propaganda that allows, it's basically there just to exhaust your critical thinking, it's to annihilate truth. And so these are the, these are the things that we're sort of um, after. So I'm just gonna end here, let's see, I'm trying to get it just to the last slide. There we go, I'm gonna skip. This is one of the most important, I'll end, with two quotes that are, I think some of the most important, one of the most important principles in BS studies, if there is such a thing, is that the amount of energy necessary to refute some of BS is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. Easy to produce, hard to refute. And that's what we're trying to do with the class. Pizzagate is an example of that. We try to give sort of uh, all sorts of websites on how to do that. We, we just, of course talked about the, the fact checking organizations. We're trying to figure out ways to create these um, public service announcements. Um, as you can see, have a little exercise. And <laughs> back to this sort of main philosophy, which is we want to teach students this, you know, not to be afraid of the black box algorithm, not just in terms of computer science, but so we see, see it kind of as a metaphor for other things as well. And the most important uh, quote of all is that the chief source that we have to contend with is also ourselves. So I'll end there and open it up for discussion. Sorry, I had to rush at the end. Um, but I do want to reach out and, and or, or have anyone reach out to me and I'm happy to have further discussions. Well, Jevin, you've given us so much to think about and, and I'm gonna ask a couple of questions myself um, as I let some of the questions uh, begin to come in uh, because I do think that uh, Teresa Kim, uh, a good friend from Southern California summarized, I mean, this is overwhelming and it and it does feel to some degree like we're you know, sort of bailing out, uh, you know, the ocean, uh, ocean one cup at a time. So, um, talk to us a little bit about the way you see, particularly with younger students, the the consumption. Is consumption a choice, or is this something that they're going to deal with, no matter what? And I guess what I mean to say is, is an answer just simply limiting access to many of these news sources and social media and devices, or is that in fact undercutting the real goals of what we have here? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, I think we're not going to be able to tell students not to to change their, you know, their information consumption habits. They're 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 growing up in a different world than we have. And so trying to deal with that, I mean, we have little models that we use uh, models in our class where we say, you know, think more, share less and sort of keep dr drilling that into their head enough that, you know, maybe don't share that, you know, one extra article, maybe dig into one extra article and that 
sort of may help clean up the mess. And I think there was a nice quote in the chat just a second ago, you know, that just this overwhelmingness and also, you know, just understanding some of the basic concepts that someone else had mentioned about clickbait does equal money. And so teaching students about the ecosystem of how money is made on the internet and that that clickbait is there because there's lots of money to be made and a lot of the fake news is driven by this system that rewards clicks. And it's transformed on for, for, for the worse, I think, um, journalism and, and they've had to make these headlines that are very um, sensational and sort of promise experiences like you know, click on this and you'll be blown away or something, or, you know, seven kitties that look like Robert De Niro or something. You know, these are the kinds of things that um, that that any human is like going to cl click on. And so, you know, teaching them little things like that and, you know, just whether that's, you know, we, we I don't think we can slow down consumption, but what we can do is at least help them understand the system in which they live, which we're in in the research world and in the and just people in general still figuring it out what we're living in. Um, let me, and so let that's me, why just having these discussions would be helpful. Yeah, let me take that question one step further. Um, and, you know, this is something that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, just one second. Uh, Valerie Smith asks, and so I, I'm going to rephrase it slightly, but but in your opinion, Jevin, what, what's the role of government in this? You know, you see a whole lot of social media folks standing in front of Congress recently. What What is the role uh, with, with regulation? Yeah, this is this is a good question. You know, and I'm usually one that sort of tries to, you know, say that, you know, maybe regulation isn't the first step, but in this case I do think there are steps that we need to now take as governments. There, the the social media now plays such an integral role into the health of democracy and society that there are things that they think they can report. And let me give you some examples. So, one, this is something I've been sort of, you know, you know, sort of crying or sort of uh, yell, yelling out for a long time now, and they're finally starting to get there. And not, it's not just me saying; other people are saying it too. That that these these social media companies need to start reporting the number of legitimate accounts. Now, that's not an easy thing for them to do, but there are ways to at least estimate it. And what you're finding with like Facebook, for example, at first they're like, "Oh, well, we have you know two billion users." Well, news just came out just a few like last week how many fake accounts they're killing on a like, daily basis. They've, they've killed hundreds of millions of fake accounts. And if people knew that it used Facebook or Twitter, knew that, that the, a bot is all that's liking their comments or sending them new content, maybe they would, uh, they would sort of um, uh, you know, look at that content a little bit differently. So, it's, so I think you know, governments could ask for that. They could ask to start to employ things like this new GDPR policy in Europe. This is this general data protection regulation, which I think we should adopt in the US, which is basically pr protecting private information more. It's like, like, for example, one of the rules is if your data is breached, you are you have to be told within 72 hours or, you know, you need to be told how your data is being sold, et cetera. And having these kinds of, this kind of regulation, I think is good for the tech companies too, because then they don't fall into what they've fallen into. Facebook has lost a lot of trust with society and they've lost a lot, you know, there's money to be lost <laughs> when people lose trust in your product. And so, so I think, I think it's time to start bringing them to the table. I don't, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think there are things that are pretty straightforward, like at least knowing, you know, knowing more about the um, sort of fake accounts, et cetera. Yeah. Th those are really great suggestions. And I don't think I heard you once mention content censorship, which is, you know, sort of a different level of transparency. Um, one, one question is coming from Scott Smith uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he asks, uh, you know, the reality is that ki kids of all ages, people of all ages who engage in social media per or digital environment really produce as much as they consume. What, oh, what are some good, yeah, what are some good ways, in your opinion, to encourage students to produce meaningful um, content and meaningful info in the social media environment? That's such it's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad that was brought up. This idea that this is what Web 2.0 sort of gave us. They gave us as a society, this ability to not only be these consumers of information and also not just depend on these gatekeepers of information, we now, we, we then went through the stage where we could produce it and we sort of depend on that. And we're now required to be the gatekeepers as well. And that's hard to do because many of us don't have that kind of training that maybe a journalist would have. Um, and so we, we're now, we're, we're the producers, we're the gatekeepers of that information, we're the filters. And so it, it, we just need better training in it, I, I think. And, and I think encouraging students, I think students for the most part, actually by, by far for the most part, 
have really good intentions and, and, and want to do social good. And so I think, you know, teaching them, you know, the importance of, you know, putting good content and the effect that their content can have, you know, of course, how it can spread and how that can have positive effects on the world. But if they also, if they're not careful and they're, they're not as thoughtful as you would want, how, how these things can spread virally. And we can use case studies and examples and the effects that it has on real people's lives. I think, you know, that's something we should be talking about in schools and in our humanities classes and in our STEM classes, because it's, it's having real world effects. It's not just this technology that they play with, um, you know, after school, um, in, you know, games. This is, like, this, this, is, this is the world in which they live now. There's a great quote, I can't remember it verbatim, but the, the point is that we probably spend, you know, more of our, we live more of our life, as much of our life now in our digital world than we do in our physical world. And, and we need to sort of pull that into the classroom. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great idea. point. Um, <clears throat> here's a question for me, actually, Jevin. Um, it, in some ways, it feels like the conversation tonight has been very American-centric. Uh, talk to us a little bit yeah. about about the way that, you know, in the digital environment, there is no geography, but in but there are, right? There's there's all kinds of influences from other countries. How has this approach that you're describing tonight been either acknowledged or adapted outside of U.S.? Yeah, so, I mean, just on a practical standpoint, our course is being adopted in several countries, mostly in Western Europe, as you, as you would expect. Um, when, we, when we wrote the book, many book, the publishers from all over the world, including Russia and China and um, Japan, um, et cetera, uh, are going to be translating it. So they seem, at least there's, there's a subset of populations that care about that. And I will say that we, we think we're in this world of hurt in the U.S., but we have, we, it's not even close to as challenging and as big of a problem it is in other countries like Ukraine. Uh, I went to a conference and I met with journalists in, in places like Ukraine and in other, you know, other countries, Malaysia would be another example, uh, that, that have much bigger problems around um, this sort of fake news epidemic. And we, we certainly have a problem and, um, and we need to address it, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a worldwide problem. And I think, I think leaders around the world are recognizing this and philanthropic organizations and foundations um, uh, are getting involved and, and sort of really supporting. There's a lot of activity going into trying to combat this, whether through automated technology kinds of methods, but even more importantly, more social um, um, and sort of individual sort of human um, driven methods um, to try to combat this. Thanks, Jevin. Um, we're just about out of time, and I, I can't thank you enough to spend uh, for you spending your evening with us. I'm glad that the the storm has held off a little bit, and we were able to complete tonight's webinar. Uh, Jevin, thank you so much for for your time and help. Uh, your contact information is on the screen. Uh, I'll echo your encouragement for anybody to reach out to you either directly to your contact information or through the National Humanities Center. Jevin, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Andy. And just, I just want to reiterate it. Please contact me. There were so many good comments on the right. I feel so bad that I, I could have done this for three hours and I would have gone, I would have loved to gone through every one of the great comments and questions. So please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to do another open discussion where there's no slides and just discussion. You, you, if you set it up, Andy, I, I'd be happy to do it. Fantastic. Thank you, Jevin. And I'd also like to remind, um, all of our participants tonight that if this topic and the work that uh, we've done with Jevin is interesting, I would encourage you to sign up for our online course, Media Literacy in the Classroom. Again, both of our fall courses are full at this point, but we'll have some spring openings um, and run the course at least a couple of times. And we'd love to give you an opportunity to spend uh, five weeks uh, really sort of uh, immersing in this topic and working with colleagues from across the country on the best ways to take this to your classroom. One of the best ways to keep uh, in touch with um, with the National Humanities Center, ironically, is through our social media. So please take some time to uh, like us on Facebook, to follow our Twitter feed, and you'll start to see uh, ongoing announcements for both uh, online and, and, and digital offerings that we have, including upcoming webinars and the online courses that I mentioned, as well as our face-to-face -face, uh, events that we host here in Durham and at other sites around the country. Again, your evaluations tonight will pop up when I close the uh, screen and you will uh, have a chance to download your certificate once you've completed that. Uh, I'll pause for a moment and answer you directly, Savannah, and say that we should have uh, the dates for those spring courses uh, very soon. Very soon. Um, so we will uh, give you a chance. To, uh, we'll put it out both on our social media and in our constant contacts. So you'll get notice for that. Um, I do want to invite you to join us in just a couple of nights. Uh, Hurricane 
uh, if the hurricane is um, is willing to cooperate for our next webinar. Uh, this will be with Bernie Carlson from the University of Virginia on the atomic voices and the dropping of the bomb. Uh, this is being partnership with the National Council for History Education, and we would love to uh, to see you there. Thank you again for joining us. If you're on the East Coast and in the Southeast, please be safe for the next handful of days. We'll see you again with the National Humanities Center Humanities and Class webinar. Good night.